Thank you everyone for coming to our session. We'll be talking about how can you build resilient Kubernetes networks using AI chaos experiments. I'm Surya Sitaraman. I'm an engineer working on the OpenShift networking team at Red Hat. I'm also a SIG network contributor. Yeah, and I'm Lior um, Lieberman. I'm a cyber reliability engineer at Google. And um, I'm uh, very active in the Gateway API community. I'm also maintaining a tool called Ingress to Gateway, uh, which helps uh, moving configuration to Gateway from Ingress. <clears throat> and as you can hear, uh, my voice um, had different plans, so apologies for that. And um, yeah, what we're here to we're here to talk about uh, resiliency. We're here to talk about networking. And as we all know, networking is hard. It's uh, kind of a big deal, right? And we have all this small niche, a lot of stuff we need to configure, we need to remember. <clears throat> but when we move to even talk about cloud networking, that's even harder, right? We have um, multiple scopes. We need to deal with regions, zones. Um, we have like complex environment setups. We have VPC peerings, routing rules. And those are just literally just a few things I had in mind to put on the slide. We need to take care about tenant isolation, encryption. And then the smartest thing, uh, the smartest thing we could do after that is uh, moving to Kubernetes, right? <laughs> and Kubernetes networking is definitely the hardest. Um, as you can see to my right, like a lot of objects, a lot of manifests kind of going on a screen. And um, in order to be able to remember, to know, to configure all that, people need to deal with HTTP routes, network policies, a lot of different objects that um, are usually um, basically a lot to remember, right? And how many people uh, here are like SREs, platform engineers, um, infrastructure engineers? Yeah, a lot. Well, bless you. Um, because traditionally, it's uh, your responsibility. And that actually should be my next slide. Um, but yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Um, policies with different labels, right? Uh, we can have broken pod networking. We can have different implementation uh, of the networking API working differently. We can have issues with SSL, TLS. And uh, as I said, bless you all, the SRE engineers, the infrastructure engineers were uh, most commonly uh, responsible to develop abstractions for these complex configurations. So the R&D team, the, the development team, don't need to deal with everything. Uh, they're also responsible for defining conformance requirements. So what is a service that actually uh, can go to production, how it should look like. Um, and usually they own common infrastructure. Um, um, usually platform components, and maintain security, RBAC rules, um, and more. Now, <clears throat> all of it, um, and uh, we even didn't talk about reliability, right? And networking is hard, but testing reliability is really important. So, so like Lior was mentioning, um, Kubernetes networking is hard. You have a lot of failure points, lots of knobs. It's a huge learning curve. Many, many things can go wrong. So needless to say, testing reliability is important. What can you do as SREs, right? You could have metrics, alerts, observability, all of this baked into your clusters. So when you deploy something, you have an incident, something goes wrong, you get an alert, you have a remediation procedure to tackle it. So you can have Prometheus, Grafana, many, many tools out there which are in the CNCF ecosystem for your Kubernetes clusters. You can use all of these, but just relying on that is not enough, right? Because it's a reactive process where you're responding to some incident that has happened. You probably want to be proactive, and most of us are, right? You're not going to launch your applications directly into production. It goes through some test loops, right? You launch it into the staging environment first, and then it goes into production. So you have the inner development loop, the outer development loop. So you have code reviews, local tests, CI, CD pipelines. Then you put it into staging. Everything is fine so far. Then you put it in production. That's when you hit issues, because you are running into scenarios that you've not expected before. right? So you test all these, but you're testing for expected scenarios or failure points that could go wrong. But what you really need is the unexpected scenarios, things that you have not thought of before. So that's really important when you think of it. And using and integrating chaos testing loops has always been there traditionally in CNCF. But shifting left here is paramount. And this is the crux of our talk here today. And we have all these amazing projects in the CNCF ecosystem. I don't know how many of you have heard of these projects that I've listed on my slide here. We have Litmus, Kraken, Chaos Mesh, KubeBurner. KubeBurner lets you do scale testing. And it helps you stress test your clusters. We also have these chaos projects, which are 
coming up with these innovative scenarios to help you test resiliency of your networks, of your cluster, right? So we have all these CNC projects already that, that do this, and this helps you take a proactive stance in building resiliency. But human-designed chaos testing have their limitations, because you usually incorporate a scenario when you have either seen it before or hid, hid it before, or you're developing something and you think of possible scenarios that could go wrong, but you usually don't think of the creative ones that come with combinations of all the components that are running in your production clusters, right? So usually humans do it based on the knowledge we have, and we don't have knowledge about everything in the production. So it's impossible to tackle all that complexity working through these. And that's where we think AI can help. So it's about enhancing the existing projects using AI, not replacing them, right? And AI from, you know, Lior and I have been working on this nice POC for the past few weeks. We can actually leverage it for creative scenarios for chaos testing in your clusters and all these backends that you see here. You can use any of these, doesn't matter, right? And it also helps you give step-by-step -step in instructions on how to introduce controlled chaos in your clusters. And the best part here is to tailor scenarios specific to your environment. So you can upload your configs, you can upload the cluster status, and then it'll tell you what possible things you could inject into your cluster for things to go wrong, right? It also suggests metrics, remediation procedures that you can do in order to get your cluster back to a good state. So basically, you can induce scenarios, see what happens to your cluster, and then go from there. So like I mentioned, Lior and I have been doing this nice POC for the past few weeks. So we've, how many of you have heard of Kate's GPT CNCF project here? A few hands, I see. So we actually leveraged Kate's GPT. But um, Kate's GPT is actually a CNCF sandbox project that uses these AI backends that you see here. But they use AI to analyze things that are wrong in your cluster. So it does an analyzer. It reads the events and then suggests things for you to you know, fix those events. But we kind of reverse engineered it. So we did a POC where we added an AI chaos command. So we are using KH GPT to inject chaos into your cluster. So you can just run this command that I am showing you here. Give me scenarios to you know, tailor stuff to my environment, and then you can run it from there. And yeah, so it gives you back these creative scenarios. And as an end user, you can choose which scenario you want to run. And the best part, like we said, we took it a notch further. We also enhanced it to read the cluster configurations that are in your cluster so that you can tailor it to your config. And then it provides you all these step-by-step -step instructions, which lets you inject the chaos to the specific namespace or pods that you care about in your cluster. So Lior is going to be showing you this nice demo about all the theory that I just mentioned here. So over to you, Lior. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Zuria. Um, and yeah, for the first scenario, um, you're gonna see you see the the command I'm using, uh, just um, small, but we're gonna see it bigger in a minute. Um, but the first scenario is I'm gonna demo like an environment with uh, gateway API configs installed. We're gonna demo some uh, routing conflicts. Let's just get started. Um, so this is the what we have for the setup, right? We have a gateway. Uh, we have a service, which is the backend um, that the traffic's gonna uh, point to, and we have an HTTP route that just configures the gateway um, to and basically uh, provide uh, instruction how to route traffic to the backend. Now let's just do the setup real quick. Um, I know it's small, uh, but I'm just gonna literally apply all the manifests you just seen. Um, so <clears throat> here I'm just gonna start by applying the deployment and the service, and um, and then I'm going to apply the gateway and the HTTP route. And as you can see in my cluster, um, this is the setup. We have the service, um, the gateway, um, and the route. Now, um, I'm going to, as I said, here's the command bigger. This is what we worked on. I'm going to use the um, integration we built to ask the model to give us three, tells, uh, three chaos test scenarios uh, to test the resiliency of the HTTP route configs. Um, and here's how it looked like. Um, uh, we basically asked the model, the model is going to give us three, um, um, three ideas for chaos test scenarios. And I'm going to pick on the first one, which is um, sudden uh, route deletion and recreation. Uh, you, can see, uh, you can see it in the top, uh, some of the instructions. You know, We need to create a new deployment, uh, which is identical. Then we need to delete the route and quickly apply it. And um, then uh, you can see the, the chat the integration we build is interactive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, craft um, uh, basically 
this instruction and tell tell the model to look at the cluster uh, specifically on the HTTP route and give me the corresponding YAMLs and kubectl commands to perform scenario one. And I'm also instructing the model to basically um, um, make it relevant to the current configs I have and to target a uh, specific namespace that I care about. Um, so here is how it looks like. <coughs> so we're going to paste the same um, uh, prompt. And we can see a step-by-step -step instructions, which we're going to uh, start and follow up. Um, so the first one is basically going to create an identi identical deployment. You can see it's called infra backend v3. The first one is infra backend v1. Uh, I'm just going to paste it uh, real quick and apply it to the cluster. I'm exactly copy pasting what the model has prompted me to do. The next one would be the HTTP route. I'm going to save it to a file, but before I really apply it, I'm going to test the connectivity works uh, before, as I expect, the current connectivity should be that if I send a request, the traffic should go to infra backend v1. So <coughs> here's how it looks like. Um, I'm gonna use uh, I'm gonna use a curl container to do it for me. So here I created a container, and then I'm gonna send requests, and I can see that the requests are successfully hitting uh, the infra backend v1, which is what I wanted. And I'm gonna follow up and continuing by ap applying the route that um, I already saved to a file. So I'm going to go uh, down to the instructions, copy paste. I apply the route. <coughs> you can see that the, the routing still go to infra backend v1, which is expected. And here is the needs uh, of the chaos, right? What, what the model is instructing us to do is to delete the original route and recreate it, and recreate it um, just right after it. That's what I'm going to do. So we just deleted it and we recreated it just a second after. Um, you can see that the traffic now goes to infra backend v3. Um, so, <coughs> and I'm sure a lot of you are probably saying, asking like, um, you know, what am I doing with a keyboard? Like how it can happen in real scenarios and I'm gonna go get to that. But yeah, the, the traffic goes um, not restored correctly, although the configuration is the same. Now, if I want to restore it, I'm just going to uh, simply uh, delete the route, the, the new route, and recreate it again. The traffic's going to be restored. So I just want to see it real quick. Um, so I'm deleting the new route. And uh, you can see the traffic goes to infra backend v1. And even if I apply it, the traffic still goes to infra backend v1. Now, as I said, it's you know just me playing with the keyboard, right? It's uh, but. Here's how it can happen in real-world scenarios. So a lot of you probably are deployed with GitOps, right? And we will see like a more visual thing in the next slide. But uh, imagine a scenario where a team uses GitOps. It can be Argo CD, it can be Flux, it can be whatever. And the developer accidentally removed the HTTP route from the Git repo, right? And a lot of us are probably also deployed with auto sync. We, we like a lot of the teams have been there in the past. We want to give independence to our developers. And the GitOps tool syncs, it deletes the routes, and the, and now we we notice an error, right? So, like, you know, not as an error, we have the fancy rollback button in Argo CD, which you're probably familiar with. We click on a rollback, but the traffic is, and, and the GitHub tool actually reapplies the route. Um, and it's in a new, with a new timestamp, which is why the traffic goes to the different uh, backend, but the traffic pattern is not restored correctly, although we click the, the rollback. And this is, this is just like um, how um, a, lot of, a lot of us are deployed, right? We merge code to main. Um, and then the Argo CD, like for example, um, see the diff, it syncs it, it applies to the cluster, the rollback doesn't work. Um, so this is literally an example of uh, how the model was creative enough to give us, um, give us basically the example which we probably couldn't think of. And this is, this is um, a good point for us, a good, like we can take a good action item to understand how we can avoid um, things like that to happen. Um, and over to Sria to discuss uh, a different demo. So yeah, I'm, I've taken a slightly different approach. Like I mentioned before, we have these CNCF projects that are already doing chaos experiments. And so I've leveraged one of these projects, which is Litmus. And as you can see here, the system message prompt that I've given is to the AI is that you're a Kubernetes networking expert. You have vast experience with Litmus chaos tests and stress tests. So obviously, it's going to use Litmus to inject chaos in my cluster. So 
I already have Litmus installed in my demo setup. So everything else is basically the same. So the, the, the prompt is basically give me three chaos test scenarios to test the resiliency of my services. So I've picked Kubernetes services as something that I want to create chaos in. And this is my demo setup. So I have one service A namespace, which has 500 backends and one service, right? Like So, so I basically have one service A. It's a cluster IP service with three ports exposed, 8080, 8081, and 8082, and I have 500 backend replicas. And then I have a litmus namespace, like I mentioned, it's already installed in the cluster because I'm using AI to leverage litmus to do this for me. And before I did this demo, FII, I did not even know about litmus, right? So it was Lior who told me, hey, we have this project litmus, and I went and saw it, and AI is the one who helped me learn all this, right? So that was good because it saved me a lot of time. But here you have, this is basically my demo setup. And here, let's try to see what happens with the demo. Yeah. Okay, so I have a cluster here with a few nodes. It's a kind cluster. I have the two namespaces that we probably care about are the litmus and the service A namespace. And in my litmus namespace, I have a bunch of operator pods, which are you don't have to know the details, but this is what in induces the chaos in your cluster. And in my service A namespace, I have basically these two deployments that you see, the curl metrics exporter and the service a, which is, you know, th that is basically the service that I'm going to induce chaos on. But then the curl metrics exporter is just a daemon set that I'm running, which will curl the service continuously so that you know what the latency of my service is, right? So that's just doing that job here for you. And I have the service A exposed, like I said, in the three ports that I'm showing here on the screen. And we have all these endpoint slices, so all the 500 backends that this service has. So it's 500 uh, pod replicas. So the curl matrix exporter, I'm just going to show you the logs. So in a good state of the cluster, it's the order of milliseconds here, right? So you saw that the the curl is taking you close to you know a few 300 milliseconds or something in a good state. So now if I start injecting my chaos in this cluster, so I'm just saying it give me three chaos test scenarios to you know test the resiliency of that service. But if you look at these. The, the scenarios it's giving me, it's giving me a network partition scenario, it's giving me a network latency injection scenario, and then it's giving me this packet loss simulation scenario. So it's, I, it's giving you options on what you want to choose, but out of which I'm choosing the network latency injection, right? All of these are using litmus to do it. And then I'm also doing the same prompt, which is give me the YAMLs, give me the kubectl commands, inject a latency of one, milli, one second, 1,000 milliseconds. And I'm also telling it to apply it to my service A namespace. And then one fine tuning that I had to do was to also tell it which service account to use to inject the chaos. So it's the litmus admin service account that I have on my cluster. So I had to be a little bit specific with the prompting here. Otherwise, it would give me something random. So let's look at the steps that it actually gives me. So it's using this litmus CRD, chaos engine. Again, you don't have to know the details. I also didn't know the details. But it's basically tailoring this to the service A namespace that I have in my cluster. It's selecting the right app label, the deployment, and all the things that we need, the parameters that I also asked it to choose, which is the total chaos duration is 90 seconds, network latency is one second, and 50% of my pods will be affected, so 250 pods, which are my backends. And so I'm just going to copy that chaos engine YAML, and I'm literally just following the steps that um, the model is telling me to do here. And then let's apply the chaos CRD on the cluster. And the next thing it's telling me is to check the status to make sure that things were created properly. So you have that latency injector done. Let's also check the status of our chaos experiment. It says it's waiting for the jobs to be created right now. And we can also check the logs live to see what's actually happening. So let's try to see if it's Yep, so it's actually creating the pods, the network latency pod and the, the helper pod, the runner pod. And in the logs, you can see that it's running the chaos. It started the experiment, and the network latency over here is one second, and it's showing you all the deployments and the labels that I'm using that I'm matching on for injecting the chaos. So it's created all the helper pods, which is all these it's a daemon set that it does it on every node, and these helper pods are what are injecting the chaos. So it's using the TC subsystem in the backend 
and it's causing it's injecting a delay on our pod at zero interface. And it's, it does this on all your, and since I said I want it on 50% of my pods, it's going to do it on my 250 pod backends, right? So we can check the chaos result. It's another CRD that Litmus creates. And you can see that the verdict is still in a weighted state. So it means the chaos experiment is still running. Let's check the curl metrics exporter pod. You can see so the latency is increasing to three seconds. It used to be you know, milliseconds. So when the service hits some of these backends, so I've, I've, I said I want to inject chaos in 50 percentage of my pods, right? So it's 250 pods. So when the service curl is hitting the backends where we have the latency, it hikes up. Of course, the other ones are looking good. And three seconds is because it's a TCP connection. So since in acts uh, um, one second by three. So yeah, so it's injecting the chaos, and now we can recheck the status of the chaos experiment. It says, yeah, the result is passed. So yeah, so we've had a successful chaos step-by-step -step experiment, which we have leveraged AI and Litmus to do here. And after the chaos is done, you can see that the time goes back to the order of milliseconds, as I'm seeing. So we've we've gone back to the good state in our cluster here. So this is the visual of what I just showed you here. So you know, I had my demo set up, and now I'm just literally using KHGPT to do that prompt. I used Anthropic's Cloud backend, but you can basically use any backend that I showed you. And it does this YAML and provides you all these kubectl and CRD commands, which is pretty cool. So you don't have to know all the intricate details, but you still need to know whether it's giving you the right stuff, right? Because you're doing it on your clusters. And so it uses Litmus to actually do this thing. And this is a snapshot of the Grafana for the service latency before, like during the chaos experiment, after the chaos experiment. So the milliseconds was the seconds latency that it injected. And now you might be thinking, oh, it's a very simple scenario. It's a few seconds of latency. Yes, you hit it in production. But you can also see how your clusters react to it. But production environments are way more complex than the demos that Lior and I are showing, right? So we also tried chaos on other objects, like network policies, on authentication, authorization, any of these, right? So it's able to pick up tailored stuff in your environments and give stuff back to you. But the key takeaway that I want to point out here, or drive home, is we have a lot of components in our production clusters. We might know half of these. We might the half of others will might be owned by other teams in your company. So as SREs, it's kind of hard. And even for the network policy experiment which we did, like there's something which will be handling the label changes. There's another thing that's generating the policies for you. So relying only on our monitoring stack is probably not enough, right? So you need to know how all of these works and then be be prepared for that unexpected, which is where we think using AI is a noble idea. But you have to be careful, of course. So there are some precautions to obviously keep in mind. And some of these points are really, really obvious. But the very first one is the accuracy needs improvement. So just don't trust it bl blindly, of course. We, we used a kind cluster. But if you're putting it in production, do it in a controlled manner. Make sure that you have good stopgap procedures to roll back, etc. And context is really required. So we had to fine tune our prompts. And one of the examples is that Litmus admin service account that I mentioned, because AI doesn't know what service accounts I have in my cluster. You could also feed all that information up. Another key thing that I remember is with the with the whole demo, one of the my environment specifics was that I was using OV and Kubernetes CNI, which has this specific aspect of doing IPAM using annotations. And so Litmus actually copies the pod YAML when it creates the helper pods, which, mean, which meant all my pod IPs were the same, which is not supported. But it's an environment specific detail and nuance that AI was not aware of. So I had to, again, feed that information and finally had to drop using OV and Kubernetes and had to use KindNet because their things were fine because it doesn't use annotations. So things like this, AI is still not there yet, and there is some work to do. And the model was not deterministic at all. So the system message is what helped us at least have some consistency when we, when we recorded our demos. But basically, there was no guarantee when you said, give me three scenarios. It, it would give you completely different scenarios every time you did that same prompt. So you would actually get unexpected scenarios when you're trying to record the demo. And security aspects. When you are uploading your cluster config to AI and it's letting you do things, you have to be, you know, you need to have guardrails around it and, you know, it's sensitive data. And finally, like I mentioned, have some well-defined remediation procedures, stopgap procedures, and so do it with care, right? And yeah, there's also some good sides of it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. We need to we need to be careful, but um, it shouldn't. We want to we want to finish on a positive note, right? Like, 
Um, as we can see, um, the model is able to process large contexts, right? We have, we had like, so yeah, in, in, in her demo had like 500 backends and everything is like, um, was passed as context and it was very helpful for the model to understand what we want to do, what we want to test. Um, we can see that the model enhances the diversity and the creativity, creativity that um, just a simple human will not be able to think about, right? Like, um, these, these models are trained on a large set of data. So uh, we could find out a lot of other tests that we didn't think of. And um, it also handles complex abstraction for users, right? If we had to um, think about all the configurations we need to config, we need to apply to the cluster just to perform the chaos, um, the model just gave us all the instructions. And sometimes in some attempts, it just gave us a bash script or a Python script to just generate a lot of load. Um, we had like, I, mean, I think Thura mentioned that we had like two other demos that we recorded. We were, we thought we were gonna fit in four demos, but then like maybe three days ago, we said, all right, we're just gonna do two demos. Four demos is a lot. Um, so yeah, like it, it literally generated um, a lot of load to, to be, and it basically also can help with scale testing. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, it has a richer knowledge base than a human has. Um, the Litmus is one example. When I was just playing with it, it just say, all right, Litmus is a nice project to test chaos. So maybe you just use Litmus and you could just leverage it. So uh, it's basically the model idea, not mine. And lastly, it saves plenty of time. Um, so I could think of a lot of the scenarios myself, so you could think of a lot of other scenarios yourself, but uh, it saves a lot of time once you kind of play with it. Um, so, yeah, if I just want to wrap up real quick, so the ecosystem is rapidly evolving. You know, you can see a lot of more and more KubeCon talks or um, some uh, have some version of AI in them. So you should use the AI tools. You should not, like, you should provide feedback to make them better because I believe, like, next KubeCon, KubeCon London, we're going to have much more robust things, things you could just use, things that can be used on uh, production environments. And the feedback is what drives them uh, better. Um, and um, you can check, the, we have the POC link um, and the uh, slides are attached to the schedule um, event, so you could, you could check it out. We didn't um, contribute to KGPT yet, we did not have time, but we're planning to open a PR. And <coughs> here is just um, our two Slack handles in case you wanna ping us. Um, I just said it um, a few minutes ago, so that's why it's a little bit weird. And, um, yeah. Lastly, if you have any questions, um, feel free to. And this is the this is the QR code for feedback. So, yeah. Can you hear me? No, I think uh, it's no. not uh, on. The can, can you all uh, open and try again? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, great demos. Thank you. I was curious if you could do something really targeted with that same format. Like, let's say you're, you want to stress test an app and say, okay, I want, could you ask it, hey, drop a quarter of the Redis traffic for this app, and it, it will generate all the, the manifests to do that? Yeah, yeah, I think it would definitely do that. It's just you might have to give it a little more fine-tuned context. So that first set sentence, which is, you know, target this app might mean use this namespace right. and these are the details and then tell it more on how you would want to, you know, abstract it in, but totally possible to. Yeah, yeah. and also you need the tools that are able to basically drop the, the traffic, right? So if you know some tools and there are some tools out there, so yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very cool, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Go for it. Check, check. No, I can't hear you. Check. Can't try again. Um, check, check. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, maybe do you have uh, advice from experience? What kind, what types of chaos tests are good? Maybe some are bad, and maybe some are dangerous. Like you can break your cluster or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think sir, so in our toolkit to the more networking side because our experience in the networking, but like. I've been in SRE for a long, long time. Um, so I don't think there's like good and bad chaos tests. The, the most important thing is you should follow specific procedure, right? And the specific procedure starts with you should have your emergency stop button. You need to understand what happens if you have emergency. You need to understand what are the metrics you're testing, right? And obviously there are some chaos tests that have been more successful to implement than others. Um, but ultimately, and just like as a broader, like, point of view, my point of view is like, 
you should literally um, encourage more chaos culture. It means that developers, when they, when teams develop new microservices, you know, you need to inject, you need to, even in like staging or like before it even goes to production, even when it goes to production, you need to understand, like to to have like kind of a chaos monkey, how it's called, to uh, inject the chaos, and then developers would be more aware of like, okay, if I don't want my service to to have these scenarios, I need to think about X, Y, and Z. But definitely, um, networking is one. Um, yeah, and I'm a developer, right? So I usually write the infrastructure code, but the tests that I usually do are one or two examples of how that would work. So the good side of the chaos testing is when you want to do that, the same thing on, on scale or lots of replicas, you wouldn't do that on your local laptop. So it's nice to use these tools to do that manually. Like doing the, doing it manually is hard, right? Flipping labels or ch seeing changing things. And then so that for that, we feel that that's good chaos tests and that's some, some things you could leverage. That's at least what we felt. Uh, bad ones, like Lior said, like probably not bad chaos tests. It's just when we used AI specifically, some of them were bad. Like the scenarios it was giving were things that probably aren't even supported, right? So that's the nuance to, to catch there, I would say. Yeah, and the, more you, and the more you refine the prompt, like, you know, you refine the prompt, you understand what you want from the, the model to do, so you'll have better results. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe on the refining the prompt part, but I'm curious if you have any ideas on how we can better pass in the context of our cluster. You know, I use Cilium, an external DNS, and Carpenter. Please design the chaos test for this app with these things in mind. Um, you know, I could probably s kind of send some of the flux repo like to it. Um, there's even like higher level things at my company. We use X annotations or we have corporate proxies, like things that might not even be documented. Um, curious how maybe we can pass those things along in the prompt as well. Or yeah, yeah. <coughs> good question. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's some stuff you're gonna need to provide yourself, like as a, you know, either as a system message. So for example, so right now we're provided like, um, you're a Kubernetes expert, you need to test the resiliency of the gateway API the network policies. But um, for the context, um, I actually, uh, we actually edited the tool um, to read the resources we wanted. Um, so for example, if you're using Cilium, and let's say you're using Cilium with a gateway API implementation, just, just as an example, right? Like, so you have a gateway class called Cilium, and you would add, the, like you would read this resource gateway class, you would read the route, and the model can try to understand, but obviously as you experiment with it, you'll add and say, okay, I'm using Cilium, this is the setup that I'm using, and like eventually you'll get you to like some meta prompt that you add to every test case that you want that basically describes the scenario for your company. And one thing we didn't show is that the whole thing is actually interactive. So maybe the first prompt you give does do something wrong or you forgot to give the exact thing, but it was an interactive thing. So you could teach it to say, oh, but my service account is not that, it's this. And you can play more with it and then it gets better. And the newer models actually are behaving much better than the older models. So in fact, the, the Anthropic one which I used, which was the, the new one released in October, the older one was three months old. I could see a huge difference in accuracy in how it was reading the cluster config and doing things with it. So there's also, I think it's getting better. But system messages and, and the, the contextual interactive prompts is what we would recommend, yeah, to fine tune. Yeah, and, and the more you get it, the configuring it, like there's also some parameters that has been shown, but we didn't really talk about them, like top K, top N, things like how much the model should be creative. And ov obviously, like there is also like models that by themselves are more creative than others, but you know, if, if one wants to drill down to understand really like the AI part of it, so you can say, all right, be zero creative. I just want you to read a cluster. Yeah, so like you could say, like for the giving me ideas, be creative, but for step by step, don't be creative, you know, things like this. Um, yeah. 